It looks like everyone's been able to connect there. So uh, welcome to this session today. We're very glad to have you join us. And uh, today you will hear from me, Sarah McCubrey. I'm an access to justice and in judicial integrity uh, consultant to the UNDP, as well as Thomas Cavedras, project specialist at the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub, and Judge Murray Kelman, a judge in Australia, Samoa, who's been very involved with projects to strengthen courts and judiciaries in Mongolia, Myanmar, Nepal, Turkey, and throughout the Asia Pacific region. He also serves on the Jin ASEAN uh, advisory group. Uh, there's more details if you'd like to read about them, uh, about our um, uh, backgrounds in on the World Justice Forum app. Uh, today, we're going to focus a little bit on uh, the work of the Judicial Integrity Network, and I thought it might be helpful to um, tell you a little bit about what Jin ASEAN is before we get started. Uh, Jin ASEAN is a peer-to-peer -peer network of judges across the ASEAN region that was established by the UNDP. Around the same time, UNODC started looking at judicial integrity globally. And so the two initiatives collaborate with Jin ASEAN focusing on the ASEAN region and bringing a local perspective to promoting judicial excellence. Jin ASEAN is supported by the US State Department and partners with other regional and professional organizations. Jin ASEAN is a part of the Fair Biz Initiative out of the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub focused on strengthening the rule of law and the conditions for economic stability. We have as a network, individual judges from across the region engaged in our networking. And we also work specifically with judiciaries in Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Jin ASEAN has developed the self-assessment checklist for judicial integrity, a process that's now been integrated into the ICCE's self-assessment process. And we support judiciaries to complete that self-assessment, to develop action plans for implementing changes, and to support projects that come out of those action plans. Today, we're gonna to talk about a project that looks to understand, learn, and then build the skills of judges to bring their human rights and equality-seeking expertise into the design of e-justice projects. Um, for so long, I think e-justice and technology development in courts has been seen as an infrastructure project or an efficiency project. And we've missed the opportunity to think about it as an approach to judicial excellence and judicial integrity. Uh, so this project really looked to address that gap. Uh, it's based on a year's worth of research into judicial integrity implications of emerging technologies in the courtroom. And you can see from this map, we looked at models of technology and research and studies into the rule of law implications from around the globe. We also surveyed judges across the ASEAN region about the different kinds of technology in use in their courtroom or in the administration of their courts. And based on this combination of research, of direct surveying and research, um, we developed the content that we're going to talk about a little bit today that focuses on how to cultivate judicial leadership in this area. Uh, and today we'll share that process with you. And we're actually going to ask you to share some of your ideas and experiences with some chats and, and in discussion, because we'd really like to hear how this resonates and what it means for you in your context. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to just stop the share here for a minute. Um, I'd like to invite you to each write in the chat your name, the country you come from, and your role or your perspective in this conversation. Are you uh, working at a development agency? Are you a judge or working in a court? Are you a funder? And that helps to introduce you to us and also give us a sense of the perspectives that you might bring to this. So I'll invite you each to just share in the chat who you are and, and what the interest is that you're bringing to join with us. And while you're doing that, I'm going to turn it over to Judge Kelman to set the context for us in terms of our discussion today. Thank you, Sarah, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Assuming that it's an afternoon for most of you, it's a uh, night time here in uh, Melbourne and in Bangkok. The title of our project is the Judicial Integrity Network. 
And the term <clears throat> judicial integrity involves much more than the requirement that judges behave honestly, uh, conduct themselves properly and conduct courts in a fair manner. The phrase has its foundation in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that provides that everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal. <clears throat> in 1985, the United Nations produced the basic principles on the independence of the judiciary, usually known as the Beijing principles. And those principles contained provisions relevant to judicial conduct and to integrity. <clears throat> However, it was not until 2002 that the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct set out a full and comprehensive statement of ethical principles, that is, the principles underlying judicial integrity. The preamble to that document emphasises that a competent, independent judiciary is essential to the rule of law and, furthermore, to public confidence in the judicial system. Furthermore, it asserts that the moral authority and integrity of the judiciary are of the utmost importance in a modern democratic society. It's important to note that the uh, basic principles, the Bangalore principles, uh, have been adopted by um, an extraordinary number of courts in an extraordinary number of uh, countries. And that those principles apply irrespective of whether the courts are common law courts or whether they are civil code courts. Civil code courts have adopted these principles just as uh, I think every common law court in, in the world. So <clears throat> the preamble looks at the necessity for judges both individually and collectively to respect and honour the judicial office as a public trust and the obligation for judges to strive to enhance public confidence in the judicial system. The principles set out six so-called values of judicial office, each of which is stated by the principles to be essential to the proper performance of judicial office by judges and indeed by the institutions that judges are members of. And those values are independence, impartiality, integrity, propriety, equality, and competence and diligence. Now, this afternoon, in the short time we have, the, is not the place to examine each of those values in detail. However, it is essential to observe that each of the six values is related to access to justice, to the rule of law, to equality before the law, to the protection of human rights and to the fairness of the conduct of the court proceeding, including the necessity for those court proceedings to be public and transparent and available to members of the community. The first of those values, independence, is fundamental to the rule of law, as I have said, and fundamental to the guarantee of a fair trial. Judges must be independent of pressure from the executive, the media and other influences, such as other judges. They must be independent of their judicial colleagues in the performance of judicial duties. Independence is a personal obligation, but it's also an institutional one. That is, the judges individually must be independent of outside pressures, but so must the institution itself. And judicial integrity in this regard, in regard to independence, is an absolute necessity for upholding the rule of law. Likewise, judicial integrity is necessary for the maintenance of impartiality. There is nothing as destructive of public confidence in a court or in the judiciary as a demonstration of impartiality by a judge. And that obligation of impartiality applies obviously to the decision itself, but also to the process whereby the decision is reached. And the issue of this process is a matter that arises when we're looking at how 
technology runs the processes in courts. The obligation of judges to ensure a quality of treatment to all persons before the courts, whether they be litigants, whether they be witnesses, whether they be lawyers, requires the demonstration of integrity by the judge. And judicial integrity requires that a judge understands the diversity of people who come before the court. And those differences can be of a wide range. They can arise from race, colour, gender, religion, national origin, disability, age, marital status, sexual orientation and social and economic status. But without this understanding of the diversity of the public that uh, are associated with the courts, uh, the public cannot have confidence that they'll have access to their courts and will be treated equally. Now it's in this regard that emerging technologies can be of significant benefit in ensuring access to justice. However, many such technologies have been created by court administrators in a search for efficiency rather than by the judges themselves. The Judicial Integrity ASEAN project has as its focus the necessity for judges to provide leadership in the introduction of and the operation of new technologies. And of course, that means that judges need to understand those technologies. New technologies, many of us will be familiar with them, the digitisation of uh, court filing, the opportunity for members of the public to use kiosks to file uh, pleadings, to file a summons, um, very much uh, used in small claims uh, jurisdictions. Um, E-forms and online filing uh, are fairly familiar to many of us in many uh, jurisdictions, uh, particularly in relation to small claims. But the use of virtual courts also. For many years, we have had witnesses giving evidence uh, via technology, but in recent times, and particularly throughout the course of the pandemic, uh, there is evidence of judges leading in the development of and the use of various technologies to enable access to justice in what has become a virtual world. I know this is the case in other courts all around the world, but where I come from, uh, virtually no civil court uh, was sitting throughout the pandemic. Judges were at home, um, lawyers were at home, uh, and witnesses were giving evidence in uh, circumstances whereby technology was provided by the court for them to give evidence from home. Um, criminal courts were a different thing altogether. Some uh, superior courts in Australia permit um, criminal trials by judge alone, but the majority uh, require a jury. And there were um, very inventive processes set up uh, at the end of the pandemic to try and continue jury trials um, in, in, a, in a virtual sense, but with the jury being together um, as they had to be uh, in such a trial. So um, there's been significant advance, I think, in um, the use of technology coming out of the pandemic. And certainly in relation to the countries with which I'm familiar, judges have necessarily been involved in that. In the past, it tended to be administrators, but judges were running these courts. They were sitting at home, uh, running courts from their homes. They had to be um, implicitly involved in the process. And I think the use of the technologies that we have seen during that period of time, I think have been mainly positive in terms of supporting the values uh, endorsed by the Bungalow Principles. However, um, there are clearly risks with the widespread introduction of such technologies. And the quest for innovation and efficiency should not take place at any cost. The fundamental rights of access to the courts and of trial fairness must be protected. And it's in this regard that the judge's leadership and commitment to the integrity principles I've discussed is of great importance. One pronounced risk is that enhanced use of technology may well discriminate against those who do not have the resources or the capacity to share in and engage in court proceedings that rely upon technology. 
the judicial officer must be fully cognizant of the technology and of the difficulty that the use of such technology may create for some litigants and, of course, witnesses and others. I talked about transparency and the openness of the conduct of courts. There's, I think, been a risk throughout the pandemic that courts have closed in because of you can't have them open, you can't have the members of public uh, coming in to sit in court and watch the process. So there are issues which have arisen uh, by use of that sort of technology. Uh, another area of technology that's been the subject of considerable academic discussion over recent times is the use of artificial intelligence. And we know that some jurisdictions in the United States have already introduced technology that recommends pre-trial detention decisions and uh, assistance to judges of that sort. The use of artificial intelligence is another area or an, another example of an area in which judicial leadership is essential in both the design and the use of the technology. And in this regard, it should be observed that the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice established an ethical charter on the use of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, at the end of 2018. And as a first principle, the Charter recognises that the necessity for the design and implementation of artificial intelligence tools and services must be compatible with fundamental human rights. And that recognition by the Charter, to my mind, underlines the necessity for judicial leadership, if not judicial ownership, of such processes. As I've said, our project, the um, Gin Asian project, has focused on the part that judges must play in the introduction and in management of new technologies. And the project has, as Sarah said, researched the impact of new technologies on judicial performance and excellence. A suite of tools has been developed for judges and courts to use to bring their skills and leadership in the management of new technologies. But at the same time, have the integrity principles to which I've referred at the forefront. The tools which the project has developed are applicable to all courts. And Sarah mentioned some of the courts, some of them are, are civil code courts, others are common law courts. They are designed to identify the role of judges in providing leadership in areas of access to justice, equality, trial fairness, protection of human rights, and anti-corruption has also been a major factor in the project. That judicial leadership is imperative at all stages of the design of technological process, including project design, testing, training of staff and judges, and of course, in the monitoring and evaluation of data. And obviously, such a process requires a judge to, communi to communicate with the computer and data design specialists and court administrators. And I think that's something that's evolving that wasn't here in the past a few years ago. However, the expertise that judges have is an essential design element of innovative court technology. And that technology must reflect and support the important factors of judicial integrity to which I have referred. It is in this regard that the expertise of judges plays a central part in the process. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge Callum, and hello, everyone. I uh, hope you are having a productive and interesting day in Hague today or through virtual sessions. My name is Thomas Kraderas. I am, as Sarah mentioned, project specialist at UNDP Bureau for Asia and Pacific. Uh, for this session on key technologies in the legal sector, let me start off with a reference to a science fiction novel that you might know called The Minority Report, written in 1956 by an American writer, Philip Dick. This book, and as you might have seen, a later film by Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise, tells a story of a future society where law enforcement foresees all crime before it occurs. 70 years later, some of the other technologies mentioned in this utopian or dystopian book are a reality, such as self-driving cars, almost personalized ads, 
and uh, voice automation, to name the few. Yet, when it comes to the historically conservative legal sector, uh, the level of technology used is not always as high as in other areas of life. Uh, nevertheless, there are significant developments in the digitalization and the use of new technologies in the judiciary. Uh, many of them actually accelerated by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So in this interactive session, and I hope you can participate here with us, uh, we will discuss these key technologies and map their usage amongst today's participants. Um, if Sarah, you can help me with the slide, great. So we will start off with online forms and e-filing. Online fillable, uh, fillable forms are designed to make it easier to submit, find, and use court forms. Uh, in the slide, you can uh, see some of the examples of use in courts. People can submit electronically various legal documents, uh, such as their court applications, uh, documents related to divorce uh, or, or child custody cases, uh, financial records, and complaints about landlords. Uh, in the survey of judges and court administrators from six ASEAN countries that uh, Judge Kellam and Sarah has mentioned, uh, in Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam, 72% of respondents indicated using some sort of e-filing system. So um, to make the session more interactive, uh, if you can, let's do a quick poll using the chat box and to find out how prevalent such online uh, forms are in countries that you represent, uh, please answer the question, uh, which is, uh, whether online forms and e-filing is used in courts in your country. Uh, you can use uh, three options. Is it widely used, just starting to be used, or not yet? And as a second question, have you used it? So if you can, colleagues, please use the chat box to answer this question. And uh, also, if you if you have a chance, please introduce yourself for those who didn't. I saw Narich uh, Rana has written. Hello, Narich. And for all the others, I see some colleagues are coming in. Please, here we go. The answers are starting to come very well. We see Narich said, widely used, not yet used personally. And if you can write the country as well, as Ana Maria did, Colombia widely used, not yet used by Ana Maria. Great, I'll give another um, 20, thank you, thank you. Another 30 seconds, and we can discuss them in discussions later on. Great. All right, as the answers are flowing in, and thank you for that, let's move on to the second tool, second e-tool that uh, has the potential uh, to support the efficacy of judicial service, uh, which is electronic case management. It's quite similar to e-filing. Uh, it, it replaces paper-based case management allowing parties to submit documents electronically and also automate some of the case management processes, including administrative and content preparation, decision-making uh, and administrative completion. Um, again, uh, of the surveyed ASEAN countries representatives, around 74% of respondents uh, use electronic case management. Uh, which is quite high. And uh, again, if we can uh, do this exercise uh, in the chat box, please uh, answer the question whether electronic case management is used in courts in your country and have you used it? Thank you, Sarah. You can see the question in the chat box electronic case management, is it used 
is it in use in courts in your country? And the second question, have you used it? Okay, we can see slow going in Canada. And Sarah, who's also from Canada, might add to that <laughs> in her experience. We'll have a chance to discuss this in another section in person. And we can see that in Mexico, it's used in online mediation. Great, thank you so much. Please, for those who haven't answered, uh, you have a chance to do it as I present the third um, technology, which became especially relevant during the COVID pandemic uh, and the court shutdowns that followed in some countries. It is virtual hearings. In essence, virtual hearings are court hearings conducted by audiovisual means where cases are progressed without the need uh, for participants to attend, uh, to attend the court in person. Uh, in the slide, you can see several examples, some of them also relevant beyond emergency situation, such as pandemic, uh, where virtual hearings uh, can be beneficial, for example, in rural areas or multi-country disputes. Great, so if we can do this exercise for the third time, in terms of virtual hearings, um, is it in use in courts in your country? And have you used it? Thank you, Sarah. You can also see the question in the chat box. Great, we can see, uh, I think the first answer from Utah, which had, was one of the first to use virtual hearings. Right. I can share from our example that in, in certain ASEAN countries and in the region, it's, it's being used and, and COVID, as you know, the lockdowns were harsher in here and courts are very interested in, in exploring this technology. So again, please, if you haven't answered, you can still do that. And we are moving to the last uh, technology to be discussed today, which is perhaps uh, closest to, to my science fiction example. It is artificial intelligence. Uh, this is an umbrella term for a wide range of methods and tools, including machine learning, uh, predictive technologies and sentencing, facial recognition, natural language process and processing, and so on. Uh, our survey has shown that it is the least used technology in regions courts. Uh, from 7 to 17 percent of respondents reported using one of the artificial intelligent, intelligence technologies uh, in their courts. So a final poll in this section today, again, artificial intelligence, is it used in your courts in your country? And uh, have you used it? Thanks. Okay, another 15 seconds to answer this question. And again, you'll have a chance to, to raise this during our discussion later on. Okay, we'll presume that it's not widely used as there are no questions yet and no answers on, on, on this uh, e-tool yet. And uh, that completes the session, this section, and we will now move on to discuss uh, how emerging technologies affect judicial integrity. Thank you, Sarah. So thank you very much, Tomas. And I think your um, responses there in that session are really interesting um, because I think this group of people's experience is kind of like most judges and most lawyers. They know this technology is coming. 
they haven't necessarily used it themselves yet. And so that's exactly where we get to this point where uh, having judicial leadership on these issues is key because we can see the ways in which um, there's a sort of general nervousness about what these technologies mean for the common practice of courts, but a recognition that this is coming. And I, th I think some of your answers around electronic case management coming in the online dispute resolution context um, is typical where online dispute resolution is already a digital process and it's easier to imagine how case management is necessary and efficient in that context. Uh, and yet where we see the real potential for judicial integrity is actually bringing some of these technologies into um, the in-person court management as well, not just hiving off online processes separate from what's happening in the in-person court. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the implications of these technologies are for a um, access to justice, a judicial integrity perspective, what it does to protect the rule of law. And then we're actually gonna open it up and um, relying on our interpreters here, for those of you who want to post questions in either French or, or Spanish, uh, as well as in English, we'd really love to have a bit of a discussion um, about how in your expertise, you see these implications that I'm gonna talk about playing out in your, in your country. So uh, I'll walk us through the implications first and then we'll take it from there. Um, so obviously uh, we see here the way that there are two parts to the um, equation that we've covered already. Judge Kelman has talked about the components of judicial integrity and then um, Thomas has walked us through what those emerging technologies are. Now, how do we figure out what that actually means from a judicial excellence perspective? Obviously the focus on technology in the last couple of years is not only motivated by, by, but very much influenced by the pandemic experience. Some courts had ongoing digital projects before lockdown started. Others are facing the necessity of online communication abruptly and for the first time during lockdowns. Some judges we heard from had experience with witnesses testifying online, with digital receipt of evidence, with predictive or auto-populated judgments or digital case management. Others stated that they didn't see a role at all for technology in the judging process. So there's a real range of judicial perspectives on the issues of technology. And I think that's even more extreme when we consider AI or the machine learning um, implications that um, Judge Kelman talked about. We need to look at each of these technologies, not just from the implications they have for court efficiency or for access for the middle income, um, well-educated slice of society, but also the implications for judicial integrity as a whole. As we talk through these implications, I wanna give us a scenario to focus on um, because I think it, it makes sense often to think about these things in terms of what it means for real people. So I'm gonna just um, share a slide here of a fictional person. Um, so let's imagine Sophia. Sophia is a 37 year old woman. She has three children. She and her partner have separated recently after a few unhappy years. And Sophia and her kids have moved into her parents' home during a divorce. Sophia works as a manager at a public health authority. Her kids are all in school. In the divorce process, there's going to be a number of documents that have to be filed with the court, including income statements that she needs to get for her employer, tax documents. Um, her ex is refusing to talk about child support and maintains that the house and all the possessions are now his. He's come to the house and to her work very angry, yelling at her about the kids. Sophia is worried about having to see him again. She's also worried about her financial future. And now hears that a divorce can cost a lot in terms of lawyer's fees. She knows that her ex-husband has a, a friend who works at the court. And so she's worried that he's gonna ask for a favor from that friend to slow down the process so that he won't have to pay child support right away. So I think if we think about this scenario, you know, this is a lot of the emotions and the realities that a lot of people feel as they're going through a family breakdown and dealing with family law. How might these technologies affect Sophia, positively and negatively? 
Um, let's look first at the online forms and e-filing that um, Tomas started us with. Here are the pros for Sophia, I think, are that the process is faster. She might be able to do that filing after hours uh, without having to take time off work and it's automatically delivered to the other side. Now, from the judge's perspective around judicial excellence, this means that the judge can know that the parties involved aren't having increased risk of violence because of that early part of the process, that that filing process happens in a way that allows um, uh, people to feel safe and to be separate from what else is going on in the uh, conflict in their relationship. The cons of that online filing from a judicial excellence perspective are that um, this process might require sort of required formats for uploading documents. Her employer might not want to provide those documents in that form. She might have trouble getting all of the documents. So now the judge worries that they don't have a full evidentiary picture in front of them. We know that anyone using online filing needs internet and computer access. And one of the things that judges are concerned about and bring scrutiny to is whether or not court processes are available to everybody. Is there genuine access to everyone? And if we are building systems that leave out those with limited infrastructure or technology, that's a concern for a judge that that means that some people are having to abandon their rights because they can't access the system. And I think in this scenario, when we think about online forms, both the judge and Sophia would be worried about data security. Can we trust the security of the documents? There's very personal information in those financial documents. Do we know that those are as secure online as they were in the courthouse? Now, I think we also worry about data security in the courthouse. Are our files, paper files, always as um, secure? And often when we talk about data privacy and digital security, we compare it as if uh, our current system is 100% secure, and it isn't. You know, there's the risk of uh, theft or flood or fire, all kinds of things that affect data security of analog files. We're just having to think now about new kinds of data risks and different kinds of consequences. I'm gonna to turn to what those implications are for Sophia when we think about electronic case management. And this one's interesting. I think one of the things that electronic case management in the in-person court system, not, not just the virtual court system, what that brings is predictability to the process. There is now a very easy to track expectation of um, how long it should take for something to move through the system, what stage it's at, whether people have filed their documents or not. It's easy for court staff or the judge to check that and know the progress of the process. And that is a protection against corruption. It's suddenly harder for Sophia's partner's friend to lose the file for a while or make a delay in the scheduling because that electronic case management system creates predictable timelines that protect against that. It can also possibly reduce legal fees by making that process uh, easier to anticipate, to know exactly when people need to have time available or be ready to participate in the process. Again, though, there's some cons. There's a security risk. Um, because now aspects of that electronic case management need to be accessed differently by different people. How will that, how will the judge feel comfortable that they know that only the right people have had, had access to the information? And I think there's um, a bit of a concern here that as we move to more predictable timelines, there's a little bit less discretion and it's harder for the judge to bring empathy into hearing about the fact that maybe one of the kids got sick and that meant a delay and Sophia wasn't able to meet a deadline. There's less room for the empathy of the human realities that come up in cases. And we need to keep that flexibility in the electronic case management system. Thinking about the virtual hearing aspect. Now, what are the pros and cons of um, the, this divorce process happening virtually? Well, first of all, Sophia and any witnesses and frankly, the judge, depending on the situation can attend from home. So in times of public health lockdowns, but also the kinds of disruptions we see from climate change, from political upheaval, having a system that can be resilient even when there is disruption helps to ensure that people still have access to justice. And that is a key concern for judges if that system can be built in a rigorous way. 
It also means for Sofia that there might be less time lost to childcare uh, arrangements, travel, waiting in the courtroom. Those increase the ability for her to participate fully in the process. And I think from um, a judicial excellence perspective, there's a real benefit in knowing that she doesn't necessarily have to see the person that she is in conflict with in the courtroom in a way that might create risks of violence or greater uh, animosity between them and their arrangements as they try to parent those children together. So there's some advantages that that greater transparency and, avail and flexibility give to this hearing process. There are also some disadvantages. Um, again, it, everyone needs to have a good computer and stable internet to participate in these virtual environments. And we know that isn't true for everybody everywhere. Um, we need to pay attention to both internet infrastructure, electricity consistency and availability, as well as the cost of um, the devices that are able to connect on to a platform like we're using today. And then the other one I think is that it's harder to tell, and this is a big risk in virtual hearings, whether a witness or a litigant is being influenced or threatened by someone else in the room. Is there another member of Sophia's family who's in the room encouraging her to testify in a certain way, threatening her that if she doesn't, her access to the kids will be in jeopardy. It's harder for the judge to assess those risks when they can't see who else is in the room. And so that's something we need to pay close attention to. Um, I think that uh, judges, we've, we've seen some examples during the pandemic where judges have, and lawyers have been alert to the signs that um, this, someone is not alone in the room and have actually had to intervene in some cases. And we're getting better at realizing how we're gonna handle that risk. But that's a new risk for um, judicial uh, perspectives to, to bring that scrutiny to, and we need to learn how to do it better. Maybe have different protocols of how we feel confident that people are secure in the environment in which they're testifying. Um, we learn from all these new challenges and that's a new one that's coming, but I think that's one we really need to pay attention to. And then the last uh, technology I wanna address while we're thinking about Sophia and the implications for someone in a typical kind of um, court case is what artificial intelligence might bring to this scenario. One of the uses of artificial intelligence that we're seeing interest in is the predictive judgment um, process where based on the facts of a scenario, um, the components or the prediction of what a judgment should be is generated by an AI system and provided to the judge to then modify into uh, the judgment that they want to release. One of the advantages of this, I think, is that um, it starts to create greater confidence amongst the public that every case will receive the same treatment and that it won't be influenced by who people know. They start to see similar criteria, similar phrasing in those decisions. And as, as I'm about to, to show you, you know, the transparency of the media is really critical to whether or not there's public confidence in the judiciary, especially around anti-corruption issues. Those predictable results might also encourage settlements, which can decrease the cost to people and can decrease the number of cases that need to go through the court process. However, before we get excited about predictive judgments, I think it's really important to recognize how much uh, empathy and human discretion judges bring to cases and whether or not that will be lost if we move to this process. We know that human conflicts and disputes are messy and nuanced and there's a different aspect in every situation. And so one of the risks um, that comes in online or automated decision-making if it's done through a predictive system like this, is that we lose the nuance. We don't hear the way that that story played out and we're not able to make decisions that help everybody involved in the conflict have the best resolution possible. Um, and I know some of the online dispute resolution um, models that are underway have a combined sort of a hybrid approach where there's first a predictive judgment and then a human decision maker who reviews that and the facts and decides whether or not this predictive uh, component is useful in this case. So as we think about um, this scenario of Sophia, I think we can see there's as many pros as cons and not just from Sophia's perspective, but also from the judge's perspective. 
that the judge has an obligation and commitment to be focused on um, the integrity of the process. And to do that, they need to be aware of the way these technologies are affecting the process. Um, when we looked at the um, study and we talked to judges across the region, we looked at some of the implications from their perspective about how these new technologies are affecting both transparency and access to justice. And people found that new technologies are making it easier for both the public and the media to observe and learn about court processes, to read and understand the decisions. Public confidence in the justice system is critical. And these consistent judicial perspectives show a positive trend as more court processes and decision-making is available and people are better able to understand and trust the decisions of the court. Um, when the media has to find the resources to send a reporter to sit in every courtroom, uh, we only get reporting on some of the really high profile cases. When it's easier through virtual courts or through more use of digital publication of decisions for judges to speak directly to reporters and directly to the public by making those available, we start to see greater trust and transparency. And I think this is very important in countries um, and, and we see a number of these in the ASEAN region that are working really hard to uh, change the culture or the perception of judicial integrity, where there in the past was a history where there might have been more corruption and there are really good structures in place now to prevent that, but we still need to wait and have the public come to trust it. And that requires relying on greater transparency. And then I think it's also true for people affected by the trial, a witness, a litigant, if they can watch that process and see directly what's happening, they trust and accept the decision. Thinking about access to justice, um, I think we can see from these slides here how, I mean, most people see uh, new technologies making the court more accessible. Technology often has both positive and negative impacts on the accessibility of justice. Increased use of automated processes reduces legal costs, which makes legal resolution affordable to more people. However, the devices and internet services required are still out of reach for many people. We need to pay attention to infrastructure and economic resources. I think technology also holds great promise for accessibility for different groups of people. People with disabilities um, can use technologies to communicate directly with a judge without having to rely on someone else to read documents out loud or speak on their behalf. Adaptive technologies integrate with some of these online systems in ways that really increase uh, the direct autonomy of people with disabilities. For the elderly, however, new technologies are off, often unfamiliar and intimidating. So now we have an inverse kind of uh, access to justice concern. As the Sophia example shows us, women facing violence may benefit from being able to testify remotely from a place they feel safe, but they also might be in a place where they're being influenced or coerced. And so again, we really need to pay attention to whether or not that access to justice balance is being met in each case. Uh, you can see from these last two slides, looking at the ASEAN region, that economic status um, and education levels are still factors that judges are concerned about when they think about whether or not we are um, actually achieving access to justice through these new technologies. So um, we were going to, um, we'd like to hear and, and talk with you a little bit more about what this looks like. And we were gonna do that in breakout groups, but we've decided because we think it's uh, an amazing resource to have interpreters here with us on the, on the session that we're gonna stay as one group and um, encourage you if you want to ask your questions in whatever language or in English, French or Spanish, um, uh, any of those languages, um, to be able to have a bit of a conversation about these three questions and what they look like from your perspective, um, both what country you're in, but also your perspective in terms of whether you're looking at this as a uh, uh, working in a development agency, as a donor trying to support this change, whether you have experience as a technologist or working on a project itself, whether or not you work in a court environment and you're looking at these technologies. Um, we're going to take a look sort of at these three questions, and um, I think I'll turn it over to Judge Kelman to start us off with that first question, but we invite you in this to um, either raise your hand in the meeting, and that will we'll, we'll just call on you, and you can ask your question in whichever language you prefer, 
uh, or pose a question in the chat. Um, and uh, if you're reticent or quiet, we might just um, invite you directly to share some perspectives because I think these are emerging issues and understanding the challenges and being ready as a global community to learn from each other is a really key part of how we make sure we don't make those mistakes over and over again. So maybe we'll start with that first question and I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Judge Kelman. You're on mute there. The question that we put up first is, what opportunities do you see that will support judicial excellence through the use of technology? Um, we think that um, views about this might differ, whether you are uh, a judge or whether you are an administrator or whether you are a uh, technology uh, development person. But um, we'd be interested in seeing um, what views you have as to what opportunities um, there are. Some of them we've discussed, um, obviously uh, the um, electronic case management system has um, some of the benefits that we've talked about. And I think there are quite significant benefits in terms of um, um, anti-corruption and uh, the issues that we've discussed already. But um, we'd be interested in seeing what views you might have about what opportunities you can see uh, to support judicial excellence. So I think if you'd like to use the chat function, um, and we might see what comes out of this. This is where we put it to you to build a little bit of a community of how we work forward on this. And we might just call on you if we're seeing people reluctant to jump in here. I see, Ana Maria, you've mentioned that in Colombia, AI is being used, only used in your constitutional court. Yes, yes. I, I actually can experience the restitution jurisdiction on, on that. And, and we can say that um, basically we, like, that's the jurisdiction that was the pilot even be, before the pandemia. Uh, the problem I think is, uh, that some regions, the internet is not as good, the, the public offices um, are not as well equipped to, to, to have all these like technology system. And, and what I have seen is that like the international community, USAID, the IDV is, is working, is working, is working very well for, for that change. But, but there is, remaining challenge, especially with the uh, installed capacity in the office and also with the training for judges. And, and unfortunately, what I also can observe is that the age is correlated with the adaptation to technology. So um, younger judges are more uh, willing to learn and to, to engage with technology. And that, 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 that is a cultural change that we should be working with judges. Can I say something about that, Anna Marie? I, I think that the pandemic that we talked about earlier um, has given real acceleration to the knowledge and understanding of judges of the technologies that are available. But I, I would agree completely with what you just said that um, um, some years ago, four or five years ago, say, um, those that were on top of technology were those of a younger generation. But I think what's happened with the pandemic is um, everybody's been forced to change whether they want it or not. And uh, I think that the pandemic, by the use of particularly virtual courts, um, has really um, done a lot to support judicial excellence. For starter, getting older judges to understand the system, um, even, even if uh, they didn't want to. I think there's certainly a, a, a shift in that appetite for change, whether that's a forced appetite for change. I know one thing we're seeing at um, UNDP is more interest, more requests from countries who are looking, who now realize 
how much they needed technology and they're trying to catch up a little bit. Um, uh, and that might be something that's being driven by the judiciary, but it also might be driven by others in the, um, in the court um, context or in the development context. Is that something that anyone is seeing in their um, context around how to bring judicial leadership into the design of the court process? You're all very quiet or very thoughtful. Well, I again, I can speak uh, for the Colombian case. I, I do think that um, judges are, are very mindful right now with this technological change, especially in these um, developing countries like Colombia. Uh, the other driving force that I think is important is, is the open government index. So Colombia uh, right now like, has this pressure to, to be like at the top of the ranking in the, in the, in the developing con developed countries in, in, for the OECD. And actually we rank uh, in, yeah, in the third uh, place recently. And, and what I can see is that the executive branch has been pressuring the judicial branch to move there is also some uh, budgetary uh, issues that uh, limit the, the leadership for, for the courts to move to the technology. But, but I can see the synergy between the judicial branch to, to want to develop these technological capacities with this open index government that is also important. Do you think that index, those indexes are being used and shared with a public audience or is that more spurring change in terms of internal kinds of processes around judges seeing that and then being more interested or more available to engage in these issues? Yes, I, I think that the civil society is pressuring also the judicial branch to share all these transparency index and all these, yes, uh, open government initiatives, both in the executive and the judicial branch. Um, I think that's great to hear. I think many people, you know, the World Justice Project, obviously, and many others, Transparency International, kinds, they do useful indexes, whether it's open government or access to justice or anti-corruption. And it's good to hear that there is a, a increasing public audience for that, as well as one with policymakers. Thomas, do you wanna take us to the next question? Thanks, Aaron. Is it the second one, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so colleagues, uh, the second question for discussion is um, about uh, tools or training that uh, the judges need to take a leadership role in this discussion, basically cultivating judicial leadership in the uh, tech evolution. So um, maybe as a, a additional question, uh, for example, has your entity, and I see some colleagues from o OECD, International Development uh, Law Organization, and perhaps from mentioned uh, countries, uh, implemented any training program or perhaps participated in a certain uh, uh, workshop, or in general, uh, you have a, you have an idea how best to, you know, train train the judges or what kind of programs. Uh, they need to be implemented. I'd be curious to hear from um, Alida talking about the online mediation in Mexico. And I think um, Jacob jumped in there around Utah using virtual courts right up front. Was there a process that helped get judges into the forefront of those changes, whether that's training or tools? Um, I think those are the kinds of examples that people learn from globally. We're putting you on the spot a bit, I know, but it would be great to hear either uh, out loud or in the chat whether you have experiences there that um, are helpful. Maybe we'll take your silence as a no. Sorry, myself, I'll put cappuccino on the... If I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, from OECD. I trust I've seen some of the 
programs or research of OECD around that question. Perhaps you have any experience from, from the files uh, that you oversee, Capuchin? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I work here yeah, in the Access to Justice team uh, within the, OC the OECD, and I'm an intern. Um, I like I don't know specifically about any uh, specific program of the OECD on uh, judicial leadership, um, but um, I'm attending the, this session to know more about also digital transformation for access to justice because we are working on that at the OECD. So yeah, I would like to. Thanks, um, thank you. Thanks, and I think uh, the next subsession. Sub subsection will be relevant to you when we'll present a little bit of, a, of our work, what we did in the ASEAN region. Anyone else, colleagues? Um, can I just say in relation to this issue of tools and training, um, jurisdictions vary a great deal undoubtedly, um, but it certainly should be up to the institution to provide appropriate training, that is the court itself. The common law countries, particularly Canada, New Zealand, Australia um, and the United Kingdom, all have fairly sophisticated judicial training programs um, which are um, teaching judges how to deal with these various technologies and, and their use. So um, the way in which it can be approached um, um, is either by such a thing as a judicial college as they're called generally uh, or a judicial training institute, or the institution itself um, setting up training. But it's, uh, I think it's going to be something we'll see a lot more of in, in future years. I think that's actually a really nice segue um, to turn to the set of tools that Genasian developed. Um, because as I mentioned up front, um, Genasian is a, um, is a peer to peer network. And so it's finding ways, as Judge Kelman just mentioned, for judges to be engaged in these conversations, not just as technical training um, on the, you know, how they have to adapt to or learn a new technology once it's already been decided and introduced to them, but it's also a way to um, uh, bring that peer-to-peer -peer opportunity to talk about these issues, to express some doubt, ask how it might work within the security of that professional relationship between judges. And I think there's real benefit in uh, the same way that judges have training on new areas of law, on changes in legal tests. They also have training on the new technologies. We have historically in the justice system really put technology in the infrastructure category and not thought of it as much as a substantive concern. And I think we're seeing that shift and that's certainly where Jen Asian's project has uh, made the shift. So um, I'm gonna um, move on to talking a little bit about the concrete tools that we developed, but I wanna keep the invitation for you to share your ideas about some of these questions in the chat as we go, um, because Ours was one project in one region, and I think there's so much to learn from what other people are doing and the issues that you might face, even if you don't have the answers. Um, so please feel free to share those, uh, or we'll have a few minutes at the end for some questions. Um, but I will um, take us now to looking a little bit more at the tools themselves. Um, the, you know, we see in the Jin Asian's approach to this, that judges have a real um, a significant role in, I'll just make, get that sh share up there, a real significant role to play in identifying the needs of court users, particularly vulnerable users. As new technologies promote transparency and efficiency, judges are the ones who will ensure that individuals in their courts are not left behind and that new technologies historically developed to meet the needs of the majority of literate, tech savvy, middle income users are not always available to everybody. They may not be available to all women, to people with disabilities, to linguistic minorities. New technologies must not only protect, but actually enhance access to justice, enhance gender equality, combat discrimination. And I think it's only with the active participation of the judiciary that the needs of the most vulnerable 
um, will be brought into that design process. So in our work, both in looking at the best practices internationally and in listening to judges in the region, we identified nine recommendations about ways that judges can bring their judicial leadership, their perspective into the design process of new technologies. And you can see here on this slide, the kinds of recommendations are ones where judges are either participating early on in order to ask questions from a rights perspective about what's happening with the data, what, what happens with the recordings of these um, sessions, how is uh, bias being eliminated or scrutinized in the design of processes. So judges are asking early on, or judges are using their control of the courtroom to make sure that people have equal access to and a benefit of the technology. Whether that is actively ensuring that witnesses and litigants are familiar with and able to um, conduct themselves well on that technology platform, whether that is ensuring that the process itself is transparent and people understand it, whether that is actually taking steps that many in the public don't see around the way that judges um, are sharing this expertise with each other to build those skills and that training. Out of this um, set of nine recommendations, we produced some tools. And these are tools designed to help judges step into this leadership role in the technology design space where we recognize they haven't always felt comfortable. Whether, as Anna Maria mentioned, because of a generational um, a lack of familiarity with the technology, although I agree with Judge Kelman that is changing fast. Um, at, at any level, once we are self-interested in new technologies, we often find ways to adopt to things we, we weren't seeing before, and not just for judges, but for court staff and for lawyers who used to insist that they needed the in-person time with their client or they only wanted to deal with the paperwork are all of a sudden seeing some of the benefits of the job security that came from being able to do their work from home. Um, of these different kinds of recommendations, we created a set of tools. And you can see here on the slide, just a list of those tools. I'm gonna to talk about them a little bit, but I'm gonna show you one of them in more detail. The, the tools are designed for judges to use themselves, whether individually as a way of uh, self-educating themselves about new technologies, or whether to talk amongst themselves across the judiciary around these issues. Um, the, there's about half of these tools that really focus on building judicial understanding of the new technologies and their implications in the court. So this is not just what is artificial intelligence or how does online dispute resolution work, but what are the concrete access to justice and rule of law implications? And how do you as a judge understand what issues are arising as you start to hear about these proposals for changes in court operations? Including how do you advocate for some of the benefits of these when some of your colleagues might be more reticent to change? Um, so these tools are on understanding from a judicial integrity perspective the implications of different kinds of technologies are concrete tools for uh, judges to use to educate themselves. And then as you can see with some of the other tools here around judicial roles in design and procurement, procurement checklists, new technologies, implications for governing of a courtroom itself, these are now tools or checklists for judges to have to start to challenge their own practices whether that is um, how they respond to a request to participate in the design process or how they handle a virtual courtroom. What kinds of access to justice criteria are they bringing in to change practices that they used to do um, in, a, in a sort of um, common way that they were used to in the way that they, they've always managed their courtroom and do those need to change when those courtrooms are a hybrid of technology and in-person courts. Um, the example I'm gonna show you is one on a checklist around procurement. And I, I chose this deliberately knowing that, um, first of all, judges aren't usually involved and shouldn't be involved in the actual procurement decision. We're not suggesting somehow that judges should start deciding which technology provider should be involved. We think it's very important for the judges to not be involved in the, the um, financial decisions about 
how the court is um, adapting to new technologies, who gets the contract to do what. But we do think that judges should be involved in the design process really early on, even at the procurement stage. Um, often judges amongst other users are asked what they need out of a new technology. And the focus of that tends to be on what the judge needs for themselves. What kind of access do they need to be able to see all of the evidence, to see the court file? How do they get access themselves? Those are important criteria, but that consultation window when a judge is asked about their own needs as a user is also an opportunity for the judge to bring issues of access to justice and rule of law protection up as judicial integrity needs, as needs that it's their job to make sure continue to be a part of the design process. And this is a time when we can stop thinking about the user as the um, judge or clerk or lawyer and start thinking about the justice seeker as the primary user. How do we make sure that technologies are advancing them, their needs? So you can see on this example, this is a checklist that helps a judge to walk through different kinds of issues around privacy and data security, to ask questions about whether or not the process is going to be uh, providing the kind of data protection that lets the judge not worry about what happens when they invite someone to upload materials, for example, to a case management system. It asks about the access to justice criteria. Does the design of the technology, think about all the things that the judge sees in the courtroom. Does it talk about gender inclusive language that judges are working to insist on in courtroom behavior? Does it require that people with different experiences, different ethnic and cultural minorities, people with disabilities are involved in the design process and consulted on how it's going to be used? Those are um, ways where the judge can raise concerns around access to justice early in the process. The same is true of rule of law considerations and judicial integrity factors. Does the, does the tender itself, does the procurement process require transparency in how the data set is being used? Does it require ways for um, a national counterpart or a development agency to participate in and have access to aggregated data to look at the uh, implications of access to justice and rule of law factors to integrate it with um, international reporting mechanisms, judges can raise these concerns that are often ignored at the design stage when everyone is really focused on the functionality of the technology and then come up afterwards as an afterthought and sometimes get used as excuses why technology can't be used anymore or shouldn't be used in the same way. And I think there's a real loss when these issues don't come up until after not only the tender has been issued, the technology has been designed, it's already in use, and now there is no time or money to go back and think about these other criteria. And so these are the kinds of tools that help judges to raise those issues earlier. Um, you know, we have a significant, um, th th as you saw from the list, there are all kinds of other tools on that in that toolkit. We are not going to talk about each one of them in detail, but we can share these here. And I think Tomas will put the links in the chat itself so it's easy for you to link on them. But the report and the toolkit are both available and we welcome you to use them however it's helpful for you. Um, the, they are really focused on the issues that and the comfort level that came from the Jin ASEAN uh, survey tool around what's happening with judiciaries and judges in uh, the ASEAN region. Uh, but I think there's lessons and tools that are available for use for other contexts. Um, you'll also see here a link to sign up for the Jin ASEAN newsletter. We are continuing to think about these issues as well as gender equality and judicial um, integrity and judicial excellence, and to share tools and resources that help judges to have these conversations so that they are better able to be leaders in this process. If you wanna hear more about those, by all means, sign up for that newsletter and you'll hear about them as they come out. Um, because I think there's an ongoing um, level of concern around and interest in this kind of training and leadership. Um, and I think now um, we, 
I want, we want to open it up for some questions for our last 10 minutes. And I see there's a few comments in the chat here. So maybe we can start with this around um, Kara's comment about the need to ensure uh, safety for and safeguards for judges in the deliberation process to prevent intimidation off screen. How is it that judges safety when they're working off site is an uh, issue? So maybe I'll turn that one over to Judge Kelman to comment a bit maybe on how judges are talking about that issue of safety. Um, if you want to, I'll, there we go. Yeah, I, I, I was interested in Kiara's uh, comment. Um, I think um, most of the virtual courts that we're talking about that have been run during the pandemic have been civil cases, but but still that doesn't mean that there can't be pressure. And um, I, I guess there's more risk um, when one's sitting in a court where there's staff uh, managing who comes in, who comes out, how things work, um, issues of security are dealt with. Um, probably a lot harder with people spread all over the place. And I think we mentioned in the course of this, there's no guarantee that um, witnesses haven't got somebody in the room um, coercing them or coaching them. Um, generally, when you have remote witnesses, they're in court management processes. I mean, uh, in our in our in our criminal system here, generally, say a victim of sexual assault will not be in the court. Will not be in the court facing the um, person who's accused. They will be linked into the court by technology. But at the same time, there will be somebody from the court, uh, one of the judges, um, associates or um, orderlies will be in the room where they're giving evidence. So one can be confident they're not interfered with. So so that is, um, as Kiera says, um, a, a real issue. Um, and I suspect in some countries where uh, one might, in criminal cases, have concern that there are gangs who or, or criminals who would be prepared to put pressure on judges. Um, I think the point made could well be right that um, uh, the judge at their own home um, could be subject to pressures that wouldn't be uh, capable of being applied in um, a physical court. That said, of course, um, um, as we talked about in terms of integrity, um, judges have an obligation to be independent and if they're issues which are affecting their independence by way of pressure it, it needs to be dealt with and reported i think there's some um uh you know some of those risks of the security and the safety of the judge come not from the the use of technologies in the courtroom as much as they're coming from technology period from social media from the increased uh access to data about people's lives, finding out their home addresses, some of those kinds of things. And I, I think courts are reckoning with that, regardless of the, um, the evolution of the court practice of technology, some more than others. And you know, in talking to judges about these issues, um, many of them frame, they, they are concerned about their own safety but they're also concerned about being courageous in the moment to do the job that needs to be done and are looking to find a balance, to find systems in place that protect their own safety without conceding some uh, loss of uh, independence in the actual decision-making. And so I think that balance is one that we continue to need to think about in a constant way that is now just facing very new challenges because of the way technology and particularly um, data security and social media is changing how we have access to information about judges. Um, I think also prosecutors and defense counsel have faced some of those same risks as well. Yeah. Um, Jacob has raised a really interesting question about um, observations about the limitations of judges involvement in technology incorporation, for example, in authoritarian contexts. Um, I, I have some thoughts, we might all have some thoughts on those, but I, Jacob, I also welcome you to elaborate a little bit in terms of um, the limitate, what limitations you're thinking about. Um, in the context of this research, um, we really saw the importance of keeping um, judicial information about judges, but also about cases, anything that's in the justice system, 
all of that data needing to be completely secure from government information databases. And uh, that's one of the recommendations, one of the suggestions that are in some of those tools for judges to bring up to make sure that data about people's court cases can't be linked with data about the rest of their lives, where they live, whether they get health services, whether they vote, um, that it's an important component of the independence of the justice system and of the judiciary that uh, an authoritarian government isn't using justice data as ways to increase risk and scrutiny to people's lives. And we see the risk of that when there is political upheaval and people who have been vocal against a government suddenly find themselves being scrutinized by it. Um, those protections can be built as firewalls in the system. Um, there's a case management system in uh, use in Palestine that does a very good job of creating really strict firewalls between ministries. So there's good data sharing between justice and maybe family support or enforcement, but the data itself can't move in between. And I think that's one protection. Although I think your question is probably also talking a little bit about judges actively being involved in the technology incorporation or the risks that might come in that transition. Any observations to add there, um, Justice Kelman or Jacob, if I've misunderstood your question? Can you hear me okay? Yes, just fine. Oh, awesome. Um, let me know if I lag. But yeah, no, I, I think um, what, what you're touching on is um, exactly what um, I, I wanted to hear about. Um, and I, I think the tool get, um, yeah, definitely incorporates some of those observations. Um, but I, I think, yeah, maybe it's, it assumes that judges can be the change maker when sometimes like that there are contexts where that just might not be as realistic. Um, so I was curious about that just because in um, maybe in ASEAN countries, there's definitely a lot of democratic backsliding. Yeah, I think that um, this, the, the protection of judicial excellence or the rule of law can't fall to any one actor. So these set of tools give judges a, a language and sort of the validation that they belong in this space in the design of um, emerging technologies, but they need to be backed up by strong development agencies, by funders, by international expectations, talking about the principles and the standards set out in the Bangalore principles and in other anti-corruption, for example, and, and data protection contexts, so that the judge's strong leadership voice is complemented by or is reinforcing what uh, perhaps a development agency is insisting on, as well as what an international body is scrutinizing for, it, it, it can't be simply judges or simply a chief justice who is the only one standing up against these kinds of backsliding or else we know what, that that puts that individual at risk and it doesn't create the change that we're looking for. Um, at the same time, I think there's times when a development agency or somebody within a ministry wants to introduce a really strong rule of law oriented piece of technology, and they need the explicit support of the judiciary. And so calling out room for judges to bring that leadership in can help to bring those, align those two to create momentum around this kind of change. And without it, we might just get momentum towards that sort of infrastructure-based change that didn't center human rights and rule of law protection and has left the judiciary out of or lost the window for them to influence this process. I don't know, Tomas or, or Judge Kelman, if you have anything else to add to that. I, I see you're talking there, but on mute. Uh, not a lot, not a lot, Sarah, except for one thing. Um, I think it's very difficult um, in many countries, and, and the issue raised by Jacobs. Uh, is a real one. However, good practice that's developed in um, a lot of common law countries over recent years is that the court ends up being responsible for its own technological management. When I was first appointed as a judge, and I'm talking early 90s, basically our computer systems were run by the Department of Justice, basically run by the government. Um, and which when you think about it, it's pretty ridiculous because um, 
in criminal cases, the government's 50% of the, the litigant and the government is a major civil litigant, but nevertheless, here was that system. What's happened over the last 20 years is that um, courts have gradually got total management of their systems. Now, sure, they might need the funding from government to implement those, but the courts are running their own systems. Or alternatively, um, they've got a body that is basically run by the courts that is providing it rather than government direct. So that does avoid some of the issues that Jacob's referred to. Um, that's obviously a much more difficult um, situation to deal with in uh, countries that are developing and have, where the courts are not sufficiently funded and um, don't have quite the pressure that they can put on governments such as uh, the country that I come from. I, I think that evolution is a really good one to call out and finding ways to learn from those models rather than having to watch each judiciary fight those same battles um, is where we hope that this kind of peer-to-peer -peer network starts to support and make the case for that in a way that's positive. I see we just have a minute left. Any closing comments? Well, then I wanna thank you all for joining us. I, we are very excited to see the way in which we can start to work across uh, the globe, across regions, through different legal systems uh, in order to make that happen and, and really to support um, the evolution of this as we go. So thank you very much. And we look forward to connecting with any of you about any additional questions.